Hey everyone, welcome back to the Echoes of Inside podcast. In this episode, I was joined by Mike Ferris. We talked about his silly introduction into the world of business. We talked about why people hate landlords and why they shouldn't hate landlords. We talked about tipping, why you should tip big. We talked about a healthy way of looking at gambling and a whole lot more. This episode was very practical. There's a lot of stuff in it that you can directly apply to your life wherever you are. And so I hope you guys do enjoy it. So you grew up with almost nothing when you were younger. Is that right? I wouldn't say nothing. We were always well provided for our food, but like we had the greatest family life ever. So we grew up with a lot more than most, much, much, much more. The greatest support system with our family, you know, three brothers that got along really well and tortured each other and supported each other. So if your question's more towards general, in general, we grew up with way more than most. If it's, if it's, uh, if it's directed more towards, you know, financially, you know, as a child, we didn't know. We were fine. We were completely fine. We had, you know, everything we would ever want. And if there was something extra, my, my dad would figure out a way to get it. He only cared about us, and so did the rest of the family. So, yeah, no, I wouldn't say we grew up with nothing. I'd say we grew up with everything. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. that's cool. Yeah. Uh, how did that shape your view on money? You said that when you're young, or because you were young, you didn't really notice what you didn't have financially. Did that affect your view on money at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that I don't think that I had a view of money that was shaped by anything other than, you know, I'd have to say the, the desire to have it. So, you know, my father was a, a guy that really didn't even care about money. And then I had an uncle that was, you know, fairly successful in the corporate world and helped guide us uh, through life or through our young lives and helped us understand the value of, the, of, of earning power and how to, not necessarily how to make money, but, but how much it mattered to make money. Uh, he wasn't a wealthy guy, but he was, you know, fine, completely well off. And so, um, but I think a lot of people, you know, and a lot of, a lot of um, desire for money is, is innate. Some people don't care. Actually, I'd say most people don't care. Not enough to try for it. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I'd, uh, I'd actually, I'd actually say even more um, that, that a lot of people don't want it enough to sacrifice for it. Because unless you're really lucky, you absolutely have to make sacrifices in life to, you know, establish some version of wealth that you can create and are um, are satisfied with. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of people, everyone, like, everyone cares about money, they would claim, but the the only proof you can show about caring for anything is to sacrifice for it, I'd say. So a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. And I also would say that the people who don't strive for it or want it, that's okay too. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. You don't have to focus your life around it. Some people might say that if you focus your life around it, you're missing out on things. But the people who focus their life around it, that's what they want to do. Yeah. I don't I don't think they're missing out on anything. Yeah, as long as they're happy. Mm -hmm. So what exactly do you do? <laughs> yeah, my main core business is real estate. So I, I, uh, I own a, a rental portfolio of properties that I just, you know, own and rent and operate. And then I do a lot of buying properties and selling, renovating, sell, selling them. A lot of my inventory comes through lifetime of connections being in the business. And I purchase a lot of properties at auctions. Uh, bank-owned properties, estate-owned properties, essentially, you know, wherever they come from. But as you, as you go through life in business, um, or you know, even in, even if you're in um, corporate world, uh, the longer you're in it, the bigger the network. The bigger the network, the more connections, and without a doubt, the more opportunities. So I always I just think that one of the biggest thing in the to do, regardless of what you're doing, is to build a good network. How can someone do that? Communication. 
communication is a huge key and uh you know leverage the people who have knowledge because if you ask people questions and they have the answers they want to talk it's just that simple if you ask somebody who knows something and you can trust they are very happy to to let you in on the knowledge so yeah always ask questions i ask so many questions it's unbelievable there's this podcaster that i listen to chris williamson and he said he's made a career out of being the stupidest person in the room, just asking questions. Yeah, he's probably not the stupidest person in the no, room. No, not anymore, but he thinks so. Yeah, well, what he's saying is he's able to put uh, his pride aside, which rhymes, by the way, <laughs> and uh, and ask the questions and not not care what he looks like by asking them. Not not afraid to ask a question that people would say, why would you even ask that? Because if he asked 15 of them, only one of them is bad, who's ahead? It's a superpower. And you only have to ask a question once if you're really paying attention. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. What was your introduction to business, say, uh, at my age or before that even? Um, so I, it might, it's, again, as a lot of it comes down to, you know, uh, your, your nature. By, by nature, I was always, I would say, a negotiator, which is very good <laughs> in business sometimes. Um, maybe not good in uh, other things because you constantly feel like you got to get an edge. Um, but so there was a book called The Want Advertiser when we were kids, and you would buy and you would sell anything you wanted out of a want advertiser. And I was like 12 years old maybe, and I would call people with motorcycles or I didn't care what it was. It could be, you know, it could be butter. It made no difference to me. <laughs> if it was for sale for $10, I'd call them up and just ask if they'd take five. And I didn't even have five, the $5 to buy it. But I would just ask. I would just start. I would just have fun trying to buy stuff, even though I didn't have the money to buy it. I actually forget the original question, but I, I guess it comes back to I had no choice. It was what I was going to do no matter what. Your introduction. Yeah, there was no inter – I self-introduced myself into negotiating and trying to buy things because I, I just wanted to do it. I wanted to see if it would work. Do you have a, a memorable first, like first deal sort of thing? Yeah, my first, uh, well, I did a lot of buying and selling of like, you know, motorcycles, like dirt bikes and three wheelers and anything I could touch. But my first, so my original business when I first got out of college was I was buying and selling motorcycles, essentially mostly Harley Davidsons. I didn't have a dollar. I mean, literally no money. And, but I always knew that there was this opportunity because I would see them in the one ad. I would see them cheaper than they should be, but I couldn't buy them. Well, eventually I found a dealer that I could sell them to, and I still didn't have the money to buy him. But what happened one time was I found one, and I got my father to get my grandmother to loan me the money to buy it. <laughs> I bought it. I sold it in a day, and the profit was you know, maybe $300, $500. I don't even really remember. It could have been $1,000. I doubt it, but it could have been. And that was like the first thing I did. And then I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And I used, um, I just used my money always to just keep buying more and more. So you said that was right out of college. I I was still in college. I was at so I've I was at University of New Hampshire for four years, and I was at UNH when I first started buying. And then when I went to graduate school in uh, at Bentley, I um I was still buying and selling, and I did some exporting of construction equipment. Again, it was buying and selling. I had a buyer over there and I would buy what they wanted here and ship it and ship it over to them and they'd pay for it. I've heard a funny story about when you were younger. Um, so you, you said that paper. If it's a funny story, did it come from your dad? It, it did. Yeah. I think so. All right. Um, but, you know, you said you got, you would look at the ads in that paper. That paper would come from the mailman, right? No, that would come. It would be delivered to convenience stores, gas stations, on Tuesday. So it was available on a Tuesday morning. I think I know where this story is going. Yeah, do you want to explain it? <laughs> yeah. So it was always about being first to be able to make that first phone call when something was advertised. Let's just say it was advertised for ten thousand dollars, and I thought it was worth twelve thousand dollars. Well, there was a lot more than just myself thinking it was worth $12,000. So if something was advertised at $10,000, whoever advertised it would get multiple phone calls. So as time went on, I realized I needed to get this book earlier and earlier and earlier. So I'd get up at 4 in the morning and I'd figure out where the first delivery was. 
Uh, and I'd drive to whatever store that was, and I'd go through the book, and I'd start calling people at 6 in the morning and, and set up the day, that Tuesday, to buy as many motorcycles as I could. Then eventually, this is uh, ethically challenging, but anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> I found the, the delivery guy himself and made a deal with him to buy the book on Monday. I'd pay him $100 for the book, for that $1.95 <laughs> book, and uh, I'd buy all the bikes on Monday. <laughs> so uh, so anybody looking on Tuesday wasn't going to get a deal. There was nothing left. The people would call, or you'd call the people and they'd be like, wait, isn't that it? Isn't it not out yet? <laughs> One thousand percent. Yeah, I'd call him on Monday and I'd say, "Yeah, I was calling about your your Harley Davidson Softail," and I'd get, well, "Where'd you see it?" Well, I saw it. it's in the one ad, and they'd be like, Is, "Doesn't that come out tomorrow?" I said, "I, I don't know. I have the book in my hand right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure when it comes out, but That's I funny. actually have it, and I have your phone number, and I'm interested in buying your bike." The reality was, people didn't care. They wanted the money. You know, they were just happy to sell something. So. They didn't care that I was the first one at the door. Actually, I made it so easy for them, they probably liked it. Just showed up, bought it, and I was gone. I'd hook up my trailer on a Monday with my truck and trailer and, and leave the house at whatever time in the morning and come back maybe in the middle of the day, unload, and go back out and buy more. Did you ever find it difficult because, like, did, did people ever not take you seriously because of your age at no, that point? never. It's never happened. Do you yeah. think it happens now? Because I'm too old. No, I've, no, no. I've, I've, no. I mean, I've, with people my age. Yeah, no. Um, depends on your level of uh, confidence and your level of knowledge and your execution. So, no, it never happened for me. I've always not now. I was always the youngest guy in the room. Always, no matter what the scenario was, whether it was a real estate deal or w whatever it was. At you know my twenties, I was usually interacting with people between thirty and sixty whatever. Mm. So I guess it was it was so normal for me. I didn't act as if I needed um, to be approved by whoever was I was talking to. That's good. If you come in, you know, if you, it's not that I came in with confidence, maybe I did because it was it was I just came in thinking I needed to do what I had to do. So maybe that you know, put out an air of confidence and that's why in general, I think people respect people who, you know, whether they're older or younger, are always going to respect people that are straightforward. People who are older, uh, yeah, like you said, they, they'll respect they'll respect younger people that are trying to work at it, you know? It's so hard to find the young people that are trying to do that. So, yeah, that's what it comes back to the questions. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a young person asking, you know, the right questions that are related to whatever... Uh, the subject matter is, whatever the business matter is, then the person who's older is going to respect that young child or young kid, I should say, and uh, and give them whatever knowledge that they can. And, I, you know, I've never really seen anybody be condescending in that setting. So Me neither. And if you did, you have nothing to lose. You can always walk away. You don't have yeah. to be. You, so you're the youngest guy in the room. You ask a stupid question and somebody's condescending. You go, okay, you're not the right guy to learn from. Yeah. So you have nothing to lose. It's true. How long did you do the bikes? Yeah, a long time. Uh, let's see. I would say a long time, 18, 20 years. Really? I didn't know it was that long. Yeah. Yeah, I started early, in the early 90s. You know what's funny is sometimes people will come in to buy a bike, and they'll say, I swear I bought a bike, but I feel like it was next door. Mm -hmm. I feel like it was, and I was like, yep, he used to sell bikes. Well, they probably wasn't just next door, because where you are now is where I started. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it was. it's both. Yeah. Yeah, it's both. That's funny. What? How did you transition that into real estate? Another good question. I didn't. I my first piece of real estate I bought when I was like twenty two. In the early in the early nineties, there was a major, the most major real estate crash of my lifetime, and there was uh, opportunities at that time that will they'll never be uh, duplicated. So I was able to save up. I always was, I used to go to, it was the same thing. I used to go to like a lot of the real estate auctions and, you know, I didn't even have the money to put a deposit to bid on something, but I would just go. I would go to all of them and just see. And I would just be like, well, I wish I had the money to buy. I wish I had the money to buy that type of thing. And um, there was a, so towards the like 93 or I think 94 when it just started to pick back up, I had saved up, I had saved up um, $10,500. That's how much cash I had, how much money I had. 
and there was a there was a um property for sale in Salem, New Hampshire. It's a, it's, it was a condo. I actually still own it. And it was on the market for $24,000. And I didn't know anything about financing, like nothing. So I offered $10,500. That's what I had <laughs> in the bank. <laughs> Came back and, and countered at um, $11,500. Yeah. So I believe at the time I took like my credit card and used a credit card check for the extra thousand and bought it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, I think it was 22. 22, 23, something like that. So I was always in real estate. I mean, I was always looking at it. Before I could buy stuff, I was looking at it and how to buy it and what it was worth. And I've always been interested in renting. Like, that was my goal. And then as as the bikes started to change for me, my desire to do it, I just uh, I just transitioned. And in, in that whole time, my whole time I was buying motorcycles, I was I was adding to my real estate portfolio. And then I just said, I'm done with motorcycles completely. Probably in like 2004, five, something like that. And now I just do real estate. I didn't know it was that long. I feel like it, or just in my mind, I feel like you stopped that before I was born, but I guess not. Interesting. No, but you weren't that old. Well, yeah, I wouldn't have remembered <laughs> it anyway, but yeah. that, that's just kind of how I picture it. Uh, so you went to college, mm -hmm. you went to college twice, right? Well, whatever. Two different stints. I went to yeah. uh, university of New Hampshire and, and, uh, studied electrical engineering. When I graduated there, it was 1991. Like I said, it was one of the biggest recessions of all time. And I couldn't get a job. I mean, I couldn't have bought a job. <laughs> I couldn't, have, <laughs> I couldn't have paid somebody to hire me. There was no, no jobs whatsoever. And I had just started doing my own thing anyway. So I went to graduate school. I went and got a, an MBA from Bentley. It took two years. So in 93, yeah. I was done. How did that help? Like, how does that help you now? Did that, did that change how it would have, the trajectory of how your life kind of went? It could have, but I wouldn't know. So when you go, when you go through school, one of the greatest things you get out of that is expanding your exposure to people. So, for instance, when I was at UNH and I was in electrical engineering, um, most of the people I was with in class were, you know, foreigners. I wasn't exposed to foreigners when I was at Pelham High School. <laughs> <laughs> so you just get a much broader view of human beings, human nature, people's abilities, people's thoughts, everything. So that's the best thing I think you can get out of college. College is training. I think especially with engineering, you know, uh, it helps you figure out whether or not you can navigate through any problem whatsoever. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, and when people hire, you know, kids out of college, they're not hiring the degree. They're bound by hiring a business degree or an engineering degree or whatever it is, an art degree. But what they're hiring is um, someone who's proved themselves with the ability to learn and adjust and succeed. That's what you're hiring when you're hiring somebody out of college. Mm. Yeah, I used to hear in high school all the time. You're, it's not all about what you're learning, but it's about learning how to learn. And it was such a pain because <laughs> everything I learned, I was like, this is useless. But you know, it really wasn't. Yeah. I mean, there isn't a single thing in engineering I ever used after I graduated other than my problem solving. You know, And yeah. then when I went uh, and I got an MBA... It was the same thing. I'll tell you, though, if I didn't work for myself, I think having the degrees would have benefited me a lot. So I definitely don't regret it. It might not have made it added a dollar worth of value to me in terms of how much, you know, I made over the years, but it, I wouldn't change anything. And I wouldn't change it for my kids either. Even if I knew that they weren't going to be in the profession that they're going to, that they're studying, I'd still want them to go through four years of school get exposure to different people, different cultures, different ways of learning, uh, even the professors, and uh, it's worth it. It's expensive. I know it's expensive, but I think it's worth it in the long run. Other than your grandmother, is there anyone you leaned on or anything you leaned on when, like, building this? Yeah, so that's another good question. Um, not really. Uh, not really at all. So my... I did have one of our best friends. His name is uh, BJ, and it's your uncle, not by blood. And he actually had a, a 
a, a, a guy that his mother was dating that was, was in real estate. And we talked about real estate a lot. And he built a, a small rental portfolio in the early 90s for pennies <laughs> on the dollar. And he was pretty much the only guy I could talk to. But he had math in his head about how he thought buying would make sense. Uh, you know, in terms of return on investment, what he would pay for a condo and what he would expect for rent and to make it worthwhile. It was a very good formula for him. Uh, I used it in my head in the beginning, but I don't even think about it anymore. It's not relevant. He was, it was, Those prices don't exist anymore. So. Yeah. yeah. What goes through your mind when you're buying a property? Uh, value. If I can add value and create something that's worth more, when I'm done with it, I want it. It's pretty simple. Is that automatic for you now, or does it still take some time? It's automatic. I, I'm a shoot from the hip guy, so it's, I don't put a lot of thinking into it. I just do it. Yeah. I guess with some stuff in real estate, uh, like if you're going to rent a property, it's not like, uh, I guess... You might not make as much as you want, but it's not like you're not making money from it. You will eventually make and, as much as you want. Yeah, and and, and you have so the the buffer at this point after being established. So maybe at the beginning you were a lot more mindful about what you're buying and stuff, but now it's not as big a deal if you don't, you know, make as much as you want from a certain property. Yeah, you you hit the the nail on the head. You're correct. Early on, you have to be more diligent and more um, uh, reserved and conservative. But in business in general, I think what pays off the most is, to, you know, it's the two words eventually, essentially the same. You need to be aggressive and you need to be willing to take a risk. You're not going to be a risk taker if you're not aggressive. And if you're not taking risks, then you're not actually being aggressive. And in real estate in general, I mean, I think I'm fortunate in the time of life that I grew up the past 20 years. has There's been dips in the real estate market, but um, in general, risks usually pay off, and especially at a young age. I mean, you know, I, I bought that condo for, say, $11,500, and let's say it went down to $5,000. I would either not own it anymore, sold it for a loss, or I actually paid for it. I didn't have a loan. Anything could have happened where it could have been a bad investment, but I would have been 22 years old, bought and sold something, maybe not had it anymore, but definitely had the experience. Mm. So at 25, I wouldn't have known anything about it. It would never have affected my, you know, my right. business life. At 25, that that whatever $6,000 that you lost wouldn't have really mattered. The money you make in your 20s is almost meaningless. It's really almost meaningless because you're going to make way more in your 30s and even more in your 40s and even more in your 50s. It's just uh, the way it is. If you think that you need to be a risk taker when you're young, in your 20s, and you're saying that doesn't matter compared to what you're going to be making in your 30s, 40s, 50s, how does that, how does that change your view on saving money? Because I know saving money is very important too, and some people like to spend it. And then people can use that that same logic where, well, this money doesn't matter as much. Like, it's it's nothing, so I can spend it. Well, there's two different things. Spending money is buying anything that doesn't have value. If you buy something that has value, meaning real estate or anything, you, you know, anything of value, then you didn't spend any money. You just transferred your cash into an asset that has value, the value is based on or comes back to money. So you really haven't changed your net worth. If you spend $12,000 on a condo that's worth $15,000, you've actually increased your net worth. So you're really not spending any money. If you go on a vacation and it costs you $1,200, you've spent $1,200 and you can't get that back. Not that I don't think people should go on vacations and not that people shouldn't spend. I'm just saying they're two different things. Yeah. And you have to prioritize what's important to you. How do you balance that? Oh, well, when I was younger, I didn't spend anything. I, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I, I was conservative. You know, I would, you know, I would buy things that had value to me. So, you know, if I wanted to buy a three-wheeler 
because I rode like three wheelers every single day in my life. I, uh, and it was worth $2,000. I would wait around until I bought one that was like $1,600. I wouldn't just buy one for $2,200 just to have one. I would wait. So patience pays off sometimes. Diligence in terms of doing your homework on finding these things. Yeah. Negotiating. Yeah, people people uh, struggle with negotiating. It's not, a, it's not something that people do naturally. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. So when you're up against somebody that that's very good at it, and I've seen people that are very good at it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most people are at a disadvantage. Yeah. Uh, people say that you should spend, not that you should spend your money in your 20s, but you should be willing to spend your money in your 20s to get these experiences because it's not going to be the same when you're older. But you're saying it's very important to... Well, at least in your case, you were very conservative. I, I guess your interest in, you had an interest in stuff that could make you money, which is these these four-wheelers or, or three-wheelers. But a lot of people, their their fun isn't that. That's correct. I, I think it's different now than when I was 20. Uh, so a 20-year-old now, you know, that has a job. I could use my daughter, Olivia, as an example. You know, she's in her 20s. She's got a very good job and uh, you know a boyfriend that has another you know also has a good job and they have an income they can rely on and they budget I'm assuming correctly I <laughs> I, I don't get too involved but I, I'm confident and uh, you know they do have they they want those lifetime experiences which is travel and you know um, say uh, out to dinner um, and they spend money on that stuff. But when you have a job like that, you pretty much know, like, next year how much money you're going to make. When you work for yourself, January 1st, the first day of the new year, you have no idea how much money you're going to make the next year. It could be way more, it could be way less, or it could be the same. So when you're on a, in corporate world and you have no intentions of getting into your own business, sure, spend your money. That's a good way to look at it. That's a good way to look at it. If you have a steady, stable job that that you can you know budget and put money aside to spend that's a good idea yeah that is a good that's a good way of looking at it i've never heard anyone say it that way really it's kind of people are more black and white with it so savings huge because if you're in your 20s and you lose your job if you don't have you know a, a solid nest egg um to so no what, what's funny is and i'm, I'm going to digress here anybody in there between 20 and 30 right now, let me see if that's right. I would say even older. 20 to 35 have have never really seen any downturn in the economy. So they don't know that it can actually happen. And it may never happen again, but it's historically it happens. So, you know, they didn't lose their jobs yet. No, they could always just find another job, usually making more money right now. Mm -hmm. mo most people can just go from one job to the other and make more money easily. So there hasn't been the ax coming down, you know, firing 20% of the workforce in a certain, you know, segment of the economy. So people don't believe or don't, a lot of people haven't had the experience where, wow, you know, they lost their job, they lost their income, and they no longer have a way to survive and pay for bills. Or they do have the way to survive and pay for bills because they saved enough money to be able to afford that period of time when things were not good. So anybody, like I said, 35 and younger, I mean, I, 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 uh, they may never be up for a rude awakening. It's very possible. But if they are, I, I think a lot of them are going to, uh, they're not going to be able to uh, weather the storm unless they get help hmm. through family. or. I know like so many people close to my age and even older that have less than $5,000 total saved it's all spent it's all gone it's like what what do you do you work where does your money go yeah well you know that's that's human nature you know people covet what they see so if they see a shiny new car they want it they covet it and they buy it they don't think about what happens if i can't afford the next payment mm -hmm. it's 
this isn't a great story, and it, it's not meant to be condescending, but it was a little bit learning, eye-opening for me. I went to college, so I was 17, and I had a, you know, I, Pelham High School had 120 kids in their high school, okay? And when I graduated, I could have got a job, no problem. And I think the pay at that time would have been about a good pay, maybe 10 to $11 an hour. And I love cars. And I remember I wanted, I wanted like a brand new IROC. I wanted a brand new Trans Am. I, I just wanted this stuff. I really just wanted it. Of course, I didn't have a, I went to college and I didn't get it. But I do remember a lot of kids that did, uh, did go out, get regular jobs, and they, and they bought those things. And I always say the same thing. You know, because I, I always came back to Pelham and I always hung out with a bunch of the kids that were from here. And four years later, I graduated from UNH with no money whatsoever and no car. But the people who were working, they only had that brand new car four years ago. And when I graduated, their car was four years old. They were almost done paying it off, maybe, but it was a four year old car and no savings. So there really wasn't any difference between 17 and 21 for, for me and for them. They got four years of partying and enjoying. And, well, they were working. Actually, are they really partying? I guess so. But, <laughs> but uh, so that's why I say sacrifice in the younger years, it pays off. It's so worth it. Mm. I mean, I didn't, like I said, I didn't get a job in my engineering field. But if the timing was right, I'm sure I would have been in that. There's plenty of opportunity to buy a cool car that you can make money on, too. Or 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 only lose a little bit, you know. So I think that that's very difficult for most people. Well, it is. Yeah. The only reason I have any idea of that is because I mean, that's kind of what we do. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you you learned it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm definitely l- lucky. F- Been with, coached. Yeah, the, the people that I'm around, we all think this way. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. My, yeah, you and my dad both work for that yourself, so you always had that mindset. Uh, at least from when I was born. Yeah, your dad had other jobs for like 20 years, mm-hmm. and I would argue with him about quitting. <laughs> I would be, you are crazy. Stop working. Go work for yourself. <laughs> yeah. And he liked doing what he was doing at the time, but I'm sure he's very happy where he is now. Yeah. So it's so much better doing it on your own. Yeah. Why do people think that landlords are the worst people on earth? <laughs> it's kind of a meme at this point. Well, some landlords are. So it depends on the experience and the narrative that people grow up with or hear from their peers or their friends. Um, but some landlords aren't. And, if you know, if you think about it, people don't naturally like people that they have to give money to, especially mm. when they have to give them to them every month. Um, so maybe that's why they don't like landlords. But I, I do have tenants that I would say absolutely think I'm a fantastic landlord, and I'm sure there's others that would – don't like me as a landlord for whatever whatever reason. Mm-hmm. I think I learned over time that it's 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 far better to be a good landlord, like a very good landlord, and take care of your tenants, and they just stay. Yeah. They stay. What what's one thing that people don't understand about being a landlord? Oh, I hear this all the time. I mean, when I tell you all the time, it's always like oh, I couldn't deal with the people. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> I don't know how you deal with the people, and I say the same thing. I'm like, it's a job. I go, you go to work every day and there's something there you can't stand doing. You don't like your boss. You don't like your coworker. You don't like the job that they give you. I don't know what it is. But just because I don't like dealing with, you know, a whiny tenant um, doesn't mean I'm not going to do my job. I mean, you don't get paid for doing things you love to do, right? You yeah. have to just do it's things. It's very rare. Yeah, you have yeah. to do things. So, yeah, I hear that a lot from just people, you know, in in, in social settings. They, I don't know how you do it. I could never deal with those, you know, a tenant. Well, you know what? I couldn't deal with the boss that you're dealing with that tells you, you know, you're five minutes late to work. I couldn't do that either. So <laughs> yeah. that's what makes the world go around. There's Give a bunch of different people. They're all different, and then that's what makes the world go around. Yeah, and you can... I mean, you can choose who you rent out to. It's not like you... you Sometimes. So, well, yeah. So, again, that goes back to see, you know, your age. You haven't seen a scenario where, you know, apartments sit vacant. That happens. I it, When I first started, that was normal. You would wait two, three months for a tenant. Mm. That was normal. And yeah, now it's immediate. Yeah, it's uh, multiple people looking for one 
They're fighting over one apartment. Yeah. Yeah. How do you avoid spoiling your kids? It's not possible. It's almost not possible at our at our in our society. Um, it doesn't really. It almost doesn't even rather, matter whether you have money or you don't have money. But it's so difficult because as a parent, you have to be so disciplined to be able to actually not spoil them. It's very very difficult. Um, it you grow up wanting to give your children everything and literally everything. Um, and now with technology, and I'll say things like, you know, how easy it is to buy something, Amazon, mm. one click, somebody thinks of something, they push the button and it's already done. When I was younger, we didn't have that ability, right? We had to, you know, think about something, save the money, then go to the store and find it. And then all that time goes by and you might decide you don't want it anymore. So as a parent, you know, when your son or daughter needs um or wants something new sneakers right new sneakers it's not that hard to say okay let's get some because you want them to have that so it's it's not easy at all not to spoil kids it's very difficult it's probably the most challenging thing you can have as a parent right now to not spoil them um, if you can push good values uh good decision making good ethics uh, then eventually you know, whether they're spoiled or not, they're going to be fine. Sometimes if it's spoiled, if they're spoiled and they are got the right mindset, that's actually a good thing. Because all of a sudden when they're older and they don't get the stuff handed to them anymore and they got to earn the money to do it, maybe they'll be motivated to go out and earn. Mm. Yeah. But I, it's a constant uh, struggle. My, so, you know, my youngest is John. He's 20. I don't have to deal too much with the spoiling anymore. But as a it, you know, young kids are very easy to spoil. It's very difficult as a parent not to. Your father and mother, or especially your father, he's so disciplined. <laughs> he uh, he raised you guys, and I'm, I don't think you were spoiled. You were spoiled in love, life, and environment. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I've been a big proponent of saying that you don't really need money to spoil your kids at all. People spoil their kids when they have no money. Um, but... Johnny and I have talked so many times about when you guys were growing up, you didn't have much financially and you didn't have the convenience that we have today. And you guys worked hard to give us the life that you, maybe not the life that you wanted, but the life that we want. And, and then it comes and you have kids and you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't like, maybe it's not best for them. And that's what makes it so hard. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you really do feel that way. You, you do absolutely feel that, you know, there's, uh, you take uh, pride and, and you get pleasure and joy out of giving the, your child something that they want. But it, it, it has to be tempered with should they have it and how easily should they have it? Should they earn it? Should they pay for half of it? Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle. I mean, I was fortunate. Honestly, my, you know, I have three kids, Olivia, Lindsay, and John. They're amazing, and um, they were definitely spoiled in a lot of ways, and in other ways, they were extraordinarily responsible. So sometimes you get lucky, even though you might not <laughs> do the right thing. Yeah, I think they, they are really good, I've noticed, about like not expecting anything from you. Like They don't expect you to give them anything, but they're very grateful when you do. That's that's what you should strive for, I think. That's absolutely true. It, oh, my God. Hey, that's not just for kids. That's for adults, too. Yeah. Being grateful and appreciative is, is not an easy thing to do. And if you can do that, then you're, um, the people you're around are always going to be happy. Mm. You're a big tipper, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, mean, I guess so, especially if you uh, compare me to, like, your dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm not, yeah. I don't There's know why There's a lot of people that. that are big tippers, but, what? Why do you say I'm a big tipper? Uh, well, I would say I'm a big tipper, even though I'm not, like, wealthy. You can be a, tip, a big tipper and not be wealthy. But I was just wondering why. Why? Why? Well, so I, I did say that, you know, I didn't spend a lot of money when I was younger. But what I did do a lot, and all the time, no matter what, I was always going out to eat. That was something I've always done. 
And I've learned that, you know, going out to eat is an experience. You're paying not only for the food, but you're definitely paying for the service because you, a meal can be ruined by a bad server. Um, so I learned to appreciate good servers. And I would much rather have the same server every time I go to the same restaurant and way over tip that server and have them look for me and have them want me as a, you know, as a patron. And um, everybody's happy at the end of it all. And what did it really cost me? I'm paying for the experience, right? So if it's a little bit more money, um, I'm happy to, to pay for that experience. And then I also know that the person I'm giving it to, and it's not a gift, I mean, they're earning it. The person that's getting it is uh, somebody I want to be uh, happy. They're creating that great experience for me and bringing me uh, and whoever I'm with at the time, you know, the, uh, the pleasure of having a great dinner. And then I'm happy to make them happy. Yeah, the beauty of a big tip is that you're not forced to do it. So being willing to do it, like, it's not like you feel obliged to do it. You do it because you want to, and it makes you happy to make them happy. Yeah, actually, I have a tip story. Just thought of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so my first big tip was probably, it was friendlies. And uh, we were out to eat. I don't remember how, how many kids I had, maybe one or two. And this waitress was, and this is this is almost exactly accurate in terms of dollars, too, um, this waitress was wonderful. She was great. She was young. And uh, the bill came, and it was about $30. And I gave a $30 tip. It was exactly double, which for me was pretty good. I mean, it was pretty. It was a good, good amount of money. <laughs> I mean, 100% tip is... Yeah, well, that, yeah. It, was a 30, it was a $30 tip for a $30 bill. She took the bill, she would goes back, and she came back crying. It was $30. So say the bill should have been, I mean, the tip should have been, I don't know, 10 she got 20 extra dollars, which was significant for her and slightly significant for me. And it completely, I mean, when I tell you she she was crying, she just was so grateful and so thankful. And that that was like my first time. I think it was, it was definitely in my 20s. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. People, you know, it means a lot more to them than just the money. They take it and they're like, what? Yeah. It's so nice. Yeah. They take it as the gesture. Okay. There's a big idea going around i'm not sure you're not really like on the online space as much so you wouldn't i don't know if you'd realize this but there's a there's a huge thing like people say if you want to be rich you got to live like the rich people yeah do what rich people do but obviously if i want to be rich i'm not going to go fly on private jets because that's what rich people do uh so what how can you find a balance between doing stuff that rich people do but also realizing that if you do everything I mean, like they, they do stuff that they do because they're already rich. Yeah, you're right. I, I hadn't heard that. And um, the word foolish comes to mind pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, if that's talking about being around people that are wealthy some way, somehow, being a caddy at a high end, um, you know, uh, golf course, okay. But does that mean you go to the most expensive restaurants and be around the people that can afford it, even though you can't? Um, it sounds like insanity. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I couldn't subscribe to that. Now, I think when they say that, maybe they're talking about it'll make you either it could make you motivated to want it. Um, you could be exposed to the people that got there, and you may be able to figure out how they did, and give you new ideas. Um, but in general, that's a tough call. That that doesn't doesn't really jive. I think it it has to be earned. Yeah, you have to take that. Uh, you have to take each each decision on its own. You can't say, "Oh, this guy does all these things, so I'm going to do all these things." You have to look at it and be like, oh, well, maybe that's a good idea, but right now, I don't have the money for this." And yeah, yeah, I get that. You you've had a lot of uh, fun experiences as anyone. Uh, over 40 w would by this time uh, from like Bruins games to poker tournaments to uh, I don't know Patriots stuff D is there any one event or something that just always comes to mind just puts a smile on your face I do like going to sporting events and I like going to watch things anything that's competitive um you know, the most, so in terms of professional sports, I've done some really fun things, a lot of championship games and all that. But 
I mean, the most fun I've ever had around a sport was watching my kids play sports. It has to be the greatest thing you're ever going to do as a parent, as, as a dad anyway. I mean, I just loved it. I didn't care what they were playing. They could be bowling. They could, <laughs> they, they could be playing tiddlywinks as somewhat, you know, being somewhat competitive, watching your, your kids be in sports is the greatest thing. I loved it. But my personal experience is other than, you know, based on family. Yeah, I, I do go to a lot of sporting events. And to me, it's worth it. It's worth it, the experiences. But as I was there when the Celtics won the last time, it was unbelievable. I was there when the Red Sox won Boston. That was unbelievable. Um, you know, I go to a lot of the Patriots games. That's all true. Um, it, and it's amazing. But I you think... You said soccer's really like, fun to watch, too. Oh, uh, yeah. So I went to a... I've always wanted to go to a soccer game in Europe because it's a completely different environment, but I didn't really know anything about it. So when I went to England a couple of years ago, I went to a, a soccer game, and it was, I can't wait to go back. <laughs> yeah, those people have passion. Yeah, you always bring that up. Yeah, they have passion. Yeah, yeah. and uh, fun. It's really, really fun. I mean, it's it's a lifestyle for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does your day-to-day -day look like now? Because obviously it's very different from when you started. Uh, yeah, so day to day, I'm mostly looking and looking for at real estate um, and trying to find opportunities to buy. Um, I do have a lot of uh, downtime, leisure time. <laughs> so I take advantage of that and do whatever I can, for, you know, whatever that is, whether it's in the summer playing on the boats or in the winter, I go do a lot of skiing. Um, but in terms of business, it's mostly looking and talking about real estate with people and uh, managing my, uh, you know, uh, apartments. I don't really do a lot of the managing myself because I do have somebody that works for me that does a lot of that. And I do, I do attend a lot of auctions throughout the week and try to buy properties. Hmm. I know in real estate, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of money being thrown around, as my dad said. Uh, and I'm sure you've had plenty of dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, where you know either you could have taken a shortcut or screwed this person over. How uh, does any of those come to mind? And like, how do you just, how do you in your mind justify, I can't do this? Yeah. Where I'm fortunate is that. I think you could probably ask anybody that's in my world uh, of real estate, they would always say that I always, always do what I say I'm going to do. So you have to do that. So if you say you're going to buy something, doesn't matter whether you sign something or not, you know, you have to do that. You have to go through with that um, because they won't call you again if you don't. So um, I've purchased things that I didn't want to buy because I said I would. It's hard. It's, it's sometimes it's really hard and you're like, oh, I don't want to own this, but I said I'd do it. Or, you know, let's say I have a commercial property and I, I promise it to somebody. Yes, you can have it. You know, when it's ready, you can have it. And then somebody else comes along and offers you more money mm -hmm. in rent and you're like, oh. but if you don't stay true, oh, you're never, it's going to cost you in the long run. It will cost you. You have to, uh, you always have to do uh, the things that you say you're going to do. There's shortcuts. Um you know, say you're renovating a house and it calls for, you know, six inches of insulation and you decide to put in four because it saves you $200. Ethically, is that wrong? I don't know. If four inches of uh, insulation is okay, then maybe it's not. But if you have to have six, you just put in the six because you're really not costing yourself that much money. Whatever it costs you, you're going to make it in the next deal. You're not going to regret it either. Yeah, you're not going to regret it. And doing the right thing you know, mostly that will pay off in life. Mm. What do you think of gambling? Because I, uh, yeah, I'm just going to let you, let you say what you want to say. And if I, because I, I have an idea of kind of the question more specifically, but I want to know what, what, what do you think of gambling in total? Yeah, so gambling, if you, uh, if you gamble, um, you should expect not to come out ahead. So you need to gamble for recreation purposes. You cannot, re you cannot gamble to make money. It has to be something you do recreationally. Um, sports betting could be the worst thing you could ever do. It, there's, I've never met somebody that makes money sports betting. 
you know, if you go to a Bruins game or a Patriots game or whatever, and you say, "Oh, I want to bet a hundred dollars on you know on the on the Patriots to win," uh, because it'll make it more enjoyable for me. I that's fine. That's just enhancing your experience. Even if you lose, it enhances your experience. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, it as throughout my entire life, we've gambled my family. It's in us, you know, we play poker, we play blackjack, we played, we did all, all of that and continue to do so. But uh, I never did it to try to make a living or even make money. Well, I want to make money when I'm there and I'm very <laughs> disciplined. Some, you know, when I, when I'm, if I'm winning, I will leave. Um, not one of, I don't usually, uh, you know, leave and regret that I lost a profit. But in general, it's horrible. I mean, they look yeah, at, yeah. you know, look at, look at Las Vegas. There's a reason. There's a reason they there's make a so reason much money. Yeah. $150,000 chandeliers every 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's kind of the idea that I was going for because you said that going out to dinner is, or going out to eat in general is you're paying for more than just the food you're paying for the experience. And that's, that's like gambling. It's really funny. My dad is how he is with gambling. Because you wouldn't assume that if he goes out to to dinner and spends has to spend fifty dollars on a good meal, he's gonna. Is he gonna? It. Is he gonna? Is I don't he, know. Is Maybe he even gonna anymore. do that? <laughs> but no, he's not gonna. Yeah, do he's that. not gonna do that. But but like gambling, he's he's like well because there's upside. Gonna, yeah, well, possible it, upside. It, there's yeah. possible. You're, I guess upside. you're right. Yeah, you're there's right. possible upside, and he's uh he's very disciplined. So you know he's he could probably win more than he loses in general. It's just funny. I feel like people, most people have their values here, and then on gambling, they just kind of have a different idea of what's okay. Uh, I, feel, I feel like most people are. I mean, obviously, gambling addiction is a huge problem, but I feel like most people are okay. But I guess that's. I guess I could say that with any sort of. I mean, most people probably don't, problem. don't gamble at all. Most people, mm. you know, you know, percentage of people probably aren't. But um, the thing with gambling is, in it's um it tests your limits so when when we would go when foxwoods first opened we would drive to foxwoods with 70 bucks in our pocket literally 70 dollars and play five dollar blackjack you know as you earn more as anyone has more they need to push their gambling to a level that they get that little tweak in their stomach and they you know it matters whether they win or lost so the more you have the worse it is because you have to risk more to get the uh, feeling of uh, uh, that that gives you the pleasure. Winning a big bet when you're 20 could be ten dollars. When you're 30, it could be you know uh, five hundred dollars. It's all. It's obviously it doesn't even have to do with your age. It's relative to your you know how much money you have. So yeah, I don't. I don't think I. I wouldn't introduce anybody into gambling. Yeah, I, it doesn't enhance your life all that much. Yeah, it's fun for yeah. sure. But uh, how is poker different? Because poker, you have a lot more control. Hmm. Poker is very different. Um, you do have a lot more control. It's still gambling, and I would say that most people who play poker lose money over over time. Yeah, uh, but it's different. It's it's a lot. It's it's definitely the type of poker that I play when I play tournament poker. Even in, if you re play regular poker, it's challenging your mind in a lot of ways. Yeah, so it's different. It's not the same as standing in front of a roulette wheel and spinning the wheel <laughs> and hoping red or black comes up or yeah. double zero. Yeah, poker's a, a just a different game. It's a, it's a different experience completely. Mm -hmm. How so? Well, you are playing against human beings instead of a machine. Even if you play blackjack, you're playing against a machine. The cards are already dealt, yeah. Yeah. right? So you there's no there's no human on the other side making any decisions. In poker, it's it's different. You're playing against human beings. You, you know, you may know that out of the five people at the table, or ten people at the table, five of them are very good, and four of them are really bad, and you're the one in the middle. Or you might be better, or you might be worse. The amount of decision making that comes up in poker, and it's every single time you have to do something. There's multiple different factors in your decision. It's very different than any other type of gambling. And it's quick. Can be quick. Yeah, sometimes you don't get time. You're like, <laughs> gotta make my decision. Yeah, but you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, poker's fun. Poker's a lot of fun. Blackjack's fun. You play a lot of baccarat, right? Uh, when I go to the casino, I like to play baccarat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, mindless though. Just, yeah. Just oh, fun. Yeah. Just, yeah. just fun. 
Yeah. I prefer to play poker over anything. Yeah. Poker, yeah, it's more fun playing against other people. Mm -hmm. Blackjack's even, Blackjack's way more fun if other people are at the table. People that you know, especially. Yeah. If everybody's winning. When people win at gambling, there's (laughs) there's almost almost nothing that's more fun. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you lose, you know, you have to take it. Yeah. You got to be willing to lose the money that that you brought there. It should be discretionary income, like stuff that you don't need to pay your bills with. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's smart. One piece of advice. Uh, this could be for real estate, for business in general, for life. Oh, for young people or for anyone? For anyone. Yeah. So... I think rely on your strengths. And when, you, when you're able to rely on your strengths, the first thing you have to do is to be able to identify them. So if you can identify your strengths and you leverage and rely on those things, whatever it is, it doesn't really even matter what it is, it, that's, that will propel you forward. You could be good at anything. You could be, have natural talent in, you know, uh, in the arts. You could have natural talent in the sciences, in business. Uh, But something you're naturally good at, you're always going to want to do and get better at. And then you, if you can focus on that, look, there's plenty of ways to make money in this world. It just really doesn't, you don't have to be, do one thing or another. You don't have to be into real estate. You don't have to be into computer science. You don't have to be into woodworking. You can be into anything and figure out a way to earn a living. But you want to do that when you have an edge and you have an edge when you have uh, uh, natural strengths and abilities that others don't have. So if you leverage those things, I think in general you'll do well. And what's a realistic goal in real estate for someone around my age? Immediate immediate um, transaction. Buy something quickly, right away. Don't wait. Find something, learn about it, and buy it. And figure it out later. Just get it. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're 20. 20. 20. If you bought something 21. when you were 18, you'd have it for two years now. You've already lost out on two years of possible experience and exposure in real estate. And, um, uh, you know, over the last two years, it would have been appreciation as well. So, yeah, I yeah. would just buy something. I'm missing out. No. You know I'm, a, I'm exaggerating <laughs> here, right? Yeah. You yeah, didn't really yeah. miss out. But my point was or is that you're not getting – the time's not on your side. The time would be on your side if you have the asset. Correct. If you don't have it, then – you're not really getting anything extra out of your experience. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, I, 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 was, I did buy early for, you know, my eight. I was 20-something, whatever, 22. Um, but you have to know what you're doing. So if you're, you're fortunate because you could leverage the people around you to help you make those decisions. But I think a lot of people, if, even if you can't, if you're interested in buying real estate, you need to do it right now. Should have done it yesterday. Let me put it to you that way. <laughs> yeah. That seems like a, a, the big idea of mm-hmm. uh, real estate in general. It's like you should have done it yesterday. Well, think of something. If you bought it today when you're 20, when you're 30, when you're 30, are you going to regret having it? No. 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 So, uh, yeah. And even use the bank if you have to. I mean, you want to be in a good equity position where you can put down a reasonable down payment. So if some, something goes wrong... You know, you're okay, but I didn't use the banks when I was younger, and I wish I had. I heard that before. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Is borrowing money, is that a cheat code to helping in real estate? It is when there's an appreciating market. When the market's appreciating, if you borrow and you leverage, then uh, you magnify almost exponentially your returns. But it gives you exposure, and you could be exposed to a downside in a somewhat catastrophic, you know, financial event in your life. So conservative borrowing is very good. Mm. You should coin that term. Yeah. It's yours okay. now. I can put it out there. Yeah. Well, it, I'll put it out there for All right. you. That's fine. It's yours, though. I mean, you can reference me, but I don't need to get anything out of it. That's but. okay. Conservative <laughs> borrowing. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. It was a pleasure. Well, it was my pleasure. It was I a lot of it. fun. I'm proud that you do this. This is a great thing. Thank you. I hope people learned a lot from this one. Uh, I'm trying to level up my pods now. I'm trying to work harder, make them better. 
You're going to have to find somebody else then if you want to level up. No, no, no. You're good. <laughs> you did great. Doing the best I can. All right. See you next week, everybody. Thank you for watching. If you did enjoy and you find yourself coming back on the regular, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Uh, so you never miss a full episode when it comes out. These are going to be coming out every week, and, you know, you don't want to miss them. There's a lot of knowledge and stuff. If you want to watch another episode, go to the left of your screen right there. You can click it. Uh, if you're on a, watching on a TV, uh, you're not going to be able to click it, but that's okay. So uh, thank you again for sticking by and watching till the end, and I will see you next time.